Ladies and gentlemen, it's currently January of 2024, and the game of chess has never been more popular. Over the last few years, millions of people have either tried the game for the first time or got back into the game after learning it in their youth. And in this video, I'm going to take us back over 400 years into the early 17th century, and we are going to take a deep dive into how the game of chess has evolved since the 1620-ish year on the calendar. We're gonna look at some of the most famous players, how they shaped the game, how chess openings have evolved and transformed the game, playing styles, eras of chess. And that's basically the entire introduction. I hope you enjoy. Do let me know if you enjoy this type of historical content. My friends, we will start off with modern day chess genius, Giacino Greco from Italy. Now you may ask yourself, who on earth is his opponent, NN? <laughs> who is NN? NN is no name. If you look at the historical uh, files of the game of chess, this is what you will find. You will find this is from chessgames.com, Greco versus unnamed victims in the year 1620, unknown look at look at the number 18 italy question mark we don't know where this game was played but greco according to modern analysis was a genius greco was one of the early inventors of taking the center greco was one of the early inventors of sacrificing pieces and attacking the opponent's king and back in the day aggressive chess was the norm and in the early stages of modern chess development just two or three hundred years ago playing the king's gambit giving up a pawn in front of your king potentially weakening your king to take control of the center was what the players love they love developing they love getting their knights and bishops out and you'll notice that actually in this game nn whoever no name is is playing in a critical way trying to defend the extra pawn trying to attack greco with this move but Greco was a monstrous player, and uh, you, know, you know now Stockfish can demystify the whole thing and say knight here is the best move, and you sacrifice the knight. But Greco did it his way; he sacrificed the knight like this. <laughs> and as we can see, you know the, 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 the this didn't exist. This evaluation bar. Uh, so I, I almost just want to remove it. And Greco used to just slaughter his opponents, swarm them with his queen and his bishop, defeating players left and right, playing these aggressive openings. But this, this, this uh, Giacchino Greco was, was a man ahead of his time. He was probably the best chess player in the world for like, a, like th that entire period of 100 years in the early uh, 17th century. Uh, and he played very aggressively, played incredible openings. But also, he played this opening, which is the Italian. Now, the Italian or the Giocopiano, and their names sound similar, Giocopiano, Giocino, they're not the same thing. Uh, the Giocopiano was actually popularized, this move Bishop C4, the Italian game, uh, by somebody named Pedro Damiano, who was actually born in Portugal in the 15th century. So, in the, in, like around 1470, this opening, taking the center with pawn, bishop, and knight, was invented. The, the beginners watching this might know the fried liver with knight g5 and this, and then the Traxler, which I have videos on. And these are all openings that we play now. But back in the day, none of that was known. How incredible is it that this position played apparently in 1620 and even earlier on the calendar is played nowadays? All top level chess goes c3, knight f6 attacking this pawn, pawn to d3. This is called the gioco pianissimo. There's piano, which is normal sound and music, and there's pianissimo, which is quiet, reserved, and playing like this. Folks, modern day chess literally blossomed out of this, and 400 years ago, they were playing these openings. I mean, isn't that mind blowing? Chess is so weird, and we just don't even have patches for like hundreds of years. But Giacchino Greco, like I said, was a, was a man ahead of his time. And when his opponents played slightly inaccurately, look at look how well he played. He developed all of his pieces aggressively, and he was a sacrificial beast. He loved sacrificing. He loved going on big attacks. And without the engine to uh, you know to to back up the claims, you you know it, it's uh, it, it's one thing. You see the computer is like, well, this is nothing. I'll I'll be able to defend myself. You know you're. What what an, what an idiot! Again, you know you're supposed to play a different move here. Well, yeah, no, uh, no. Back back in the day, they did not know that. And Greco was a monster. Look at this, allowing his own rook to be trapped in the corner because his attack is actually better than his opponent. He allows a queen, but he swarms in and uh, gets a very nice checkmate. Knight can't take the queen because it's defended. All this pressure, but it's incredible how this style of play 
the Italian with two pawns in the center like this, taking the center, knights and bishops. This was played in, in 17th century. Now, the next era of chess, after the 1600s, like the 18th century, the 1700s, 1700 to 1799, um, was the early stages of the Romantic era. The Romantic era of chess was born out of openings like the Italian. It was born out of openings like the King's Gambit. And the leading player of the 18th century was uh, François-André Philidor, who was French. Now, there were other players as well, but Philidor arguably was the greatest player of the 18th century. And um, in particular, one of the things that, 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 that Philidor did and one of his major contributions was endgame studies. Before I show you one of his games, you say, what? Yeah, well, back in the day, back in the 18th century, you could invent theory. So Philidor invented the fact that the defending side in a rook and one pawn endgame can get the Philidor position on the third rank of defense. You know, back in the day, black would go here, white would do this, black would go here, white would, you know, like do this, and then, and then, and then, and then lose. Okay, like, <clears throat> there, you know, you, you, somehow this pawn would promote and then, but, but, but no. Philidor discovered in the 18th century that if a pawn hasn't crossed the third rank in a rook and pawn endgame, with proper defensive setup, you'd get this, and this is called Philidor position. You disallow the king's access, and the second that the pawn crosses, you go back to the other side, you start giving checks. That's what the Philidor position is, and it was based on the work of François-André Philidor. It's just unbelievable that in the 18th century, you could literally pioneer transformational chess theory. Now this is taught in every intermediate and advanced endgame book, maybe sometimes to beginners as well. Now, Philidor also had an opening. He loved to defend his center pawn like this. Back in the day, you could literally invent theory on the second move. You could be like, yeah, I just guard my pawn with d6, and then he would he'd love to play f5. It was like a modern day Vienna. Many of you know the Vienna opening where you attack the center with an F-pawn. And Philidor used to do this with both colors. He would say, it's better to trade off a flank pawn for a center pawn. So for example, D3, <clears throat> not saying this is what he would do, but he loved having two pawns versus one in the center. That's the way he would, he would change the game. He played moves like F5. It's good to trade your king's bishop pawn for a king's pawn because that way you have more control of the center of the board. Just unbelievable stuff, right? Like, th this, this is the man who was the leading pioneer of chess in the 18th century. Look at this. Dominant central control, strong pieces, and then, as always back in the day, they didn't care about bishop pair. Nobody cared that one side has two bishops. That's a positional style. What they tried to do back in the day is attack at all costs. And again, computer is not always convinced, but this is the way chess was in the 18th century. This is the way you would play it. You would sacrifice. Right? Pawns are the souls of chess. Pawns are, are the soul of chess, is something that Philidor said. And they would just go on these big attacks and then transition the game into an endgame and ultimately win it. That was chess in the 18th century. It was romantic. It was sacrificing pawns for open lines. And in particular, the 1800s is when all of this skyrocketed. In the 1800s, we had the birth of a new era of romantic chess starting with Paul Morphy. Now, I will just quickly check in on this uh, amazing article that I found on chess.com, uh, which, uh, which has like kind of the entire backbone of history of chess. Uh, I will link it in the description if you'd like to read it. It's by uh, Colin uh, Stepchinsky and... Step not Stepchinsky. Step Stepchinsky. There we go, Stepchinsky. Beautiful. And um, in particular, Paul Morphy... Uh, was, was kind of the embodiment of romantic and aggressive attacking ideas. He trounced every major player in the world at the time, and in particular in the 1800s is when modern chess tournaments were born. So players like Howard Staunton, Adolf Anderson, Louis, Paul, uh, Louis Paulson, as you can see here, participated in the first ever chess tournament that was held in 1851. The first ever chess tournament was held in 1851. They had this genius idea to get a bunch of dudes in a room Last time they took a shower or a bath was debatable. I'm not even sure we had showers in 1851. And this is, of course, the opera game. This is a very famous game. If you don't know this game, after this video, go look up the opera game. This is a game played by Paul Morphy and Duke Carl. It's called Night at the Opera. And uh, it features tactical aggressive chess, threats of checkmate, rampant development of all of, uh, of, all of the pieces, sacrifice of the knight to open up the Black King, long castle, sacrifice of the rook, and then... Sacrifice of the Queen. 
you gotta take Rook D8. This is this is called the Opera game. It's called the Knight at the Opera. It's got a lot of very fascinating tactical motifs. If you're frustrated because I went through it too fast, this is gonna be like a 45 minute video probably, so I don't wanna add another 30 minutes to it, but this game has been covered in great detail, including on this YouTube channel. The point is that back in the day, this is the way they play chess. It was swashbuckling, it was sacrificing, sometimes it was dangerous and dicey, but they didn't have a schmuck AI to tell them that what they were doing was not, not correct. Also around that time, all right, we had guys like I, like I said, Adolf Anderson, who played both the Immortal game and the Evergreen game. He started with the King's Gambit. This is the, this is the famous Immortal game, where he basically sacrificed every single uh, piece to his name. They, they hated, they hated castling back in the, in the, in the mid-19th century. They hated castling. They believed in center control, quick development, trapping their opponent's pieces. Look at this. Gambiting a pawn to deflect the bishop off of the King's situation over here. This is the way they played. This is what they played. Like I said, there was no AI back in the day. The games were crazy, complicated. The computer now says it's equal. But back in the day, they would sacrifice pieces left and right. Look at this. Bullying the black position. Knight c3, knight d5. He sacrificed his, his rook over here. He sacrificed the other rook with a check. But when the dust settled, he found knight takes g7, king slides over, sacrificing the queen for a checkmate. Now. You look at these games, and you look at chessgames.com, you look at some of the historical uh, files of the games of chess, you, you don't quite understand how these things happen, because, like, did they happen in a tournament? For example, even one move before disaster, the position according to Stockfish is equal. <laughs> like, apparently, instead of knight a6, you have to go here, because then the king escapes. Knight g7, king d8, queen f6, like, this is all great, that's not mate, because the king can go there. So, you know, you look at some of these historical games, you go, wait a minute, but the, he, what? But it says he could go here. Like, why didn't they see that? Because they, I don't know, they, they were distracted. They weren't as good. You know, that, that's just like, <laughs> I, really, it, it's fascinating because when you find these games, the information for chess just didn't travel. Chess was kind of this hyper niche activity, even in the 19th century, until 1851, when we started having our first international chess tournaments. And we had guys like Adolf Anderson. We had players like Paul Morphy. Like I said, Howard Staunton. Staunton. Speaking of which, Staunton, the Staunton Gambit, like this in the Dutch. We, we have openings named after all of these players. Morphy's defense of the Rue Lopez, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. We already saw how this opening is played for 400 years. Morphy's defense targeting the bishop in the Spanish, an opening that is played all the way up until now, right? Now, something changed right after the era of Paul Morphy and, and Adolf Anderson. And I will pop over... Um, to our, uh, to our other window, and I will scroll down a little bit, and this is, the, this is the birth, the late 19th century, the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, this is the birth of a couple of things. Number one, this is the birth of modern day world champions. Chess never had world champions. We had a bunch of dudes meeting at a club and they would play, and I don't know, they'd play for hours. I mean, they would play for days. Back then they would seal moves. You know, nowadays you can't even play a daily game on chess.com without somebody cheating. Back in the day, they would seal moves. There was no cheating. This was the birth of modern-day world champions, and in particular, positional chess. Wilhelm Steinitz was at the forefront, and um, he had a disdain for overly aggressive play, and he would uh, accept gambited pawns, close the position down, and grind out wins. He had no equal in the style of positional play. And also, at the same time, uh, right around, you know, the, uh, when Steinitz uh, was, uh, was elevating... Uh, in status, so was a grandmaster by the name of, uh, rather, not a grand, a very strong chess master, by the name of Sigbert Tarash. And Tarash advocated for a lot of very fascinating things. Uh, right around that time in the early 1900s, Tarash came along, Steinitz came along, and these players, they would, they, they, they were very different. They were very, very different. They liked control of the center, but they liked bishop pair they would they would trade a knight for a bishop that was the early days of discovering a bishop is worth more than a knight they liked space they believed that the person that has a space advantage and is playing on a side of a board with a space advantage could potentially get a uh, a long-term winning opportunity but they went head to head with players from the slightly next generation uh which are players like nimsevich ready uh, Emmanuel Lasker. So there was a scientific era and a hyper-modern era. And they clashed. 
That was the, the birth of positional chess. Chess that did not require crazy sacrifices that we could see could be deemed slightly dubious. And you say, well, well what, is, what is all that? Well, instead of controlling the center with your pawns, what they would like to do is they, the, the, the hypermodernists, particularly by the name of Aaron Nimsovich, love to control the center with their pieces. So players like Reddy, this is called the Reddy opening. You control the center with your, with your pieces. You don't need pawns in the center. For example, you control the center with your pieces, right? You fight for the center from a distance. You, you don't always need to stuff the center full of two pawns. Well, this was a fascinating game played by two of the leading proponents of these styles. Nimsovich was a player that loved to control the center with his pieces. Tarash was a, was a player that believed in his methodology. And I just found this game very fascinating because, you know, again, we have, a, we have a mutual control of the center with pawns, right? We have a Queen's Gambit. Queen's Gambit became very popular in the early 1900s is when the, the players started, started using these openings. Look at this. This is Nimsovich. That's typical Nimsovich putting his bishop over here. And by the way, look at Tarash, right? So they would, they would take from each other. They would, they would take from each other. They would learn from each other. Very, very symmetrical game. But as the center opened up, you'll notice, right? Tarash stops the knight from coming to f5. He doesn't want his opponent to get the bishop pair, right? Very interesting stuff. And now takes, takes, bishop b5. And when the dust settles, it's black who has the center and the bishop pair. And so black imposed his game plan. They, they, they love this stuff. This is exactly what they wanted. They love the sniper-esque bishops, the control of the space in the center of the board. And then, of course, they had to play, right? And Black plays this move d4 and then sacrifices the bishop, spotting an opportunity that these bishops actually can close line the king. There's no defense. Bishop takes h2 by Tarash, and then he would get his queen in, and he sacrificed the second bishop as well. And the thing is, if you take, you stuff the king back to the h file with a move like, you know, king h1, and then the rook comes to help. And this was how the hypermodern system failed because the hypermodern system the pieces would be stuck back fighting for the center but if you stuff them shut like with pawns you could get attacks like this it's just it's just very interesting like the clash of the styles right you get the bishop pair you get the control of the center of course i'm simple i'm simplifying a bit yes absolutely but my point stands i'm simplifying a little bit but the point stands, this was chess in the early 20th century. It was this developing, blossoming concept, you know, of these players like Steinitz, Lasker, and then, of course, Capablanca. Um, and uh, let me just show you the conclusion of this game, how Tarash managed to beat Nimsevich by swarming him with his, uh, with his playing style, hunting his king ruthlessly into the center. And look at this. Look at this sniper set of pieces. All squares control the king. What a walk of shame, ridiculous stuff, ridiculous stuff. Around this time of Tarash, etc., cetera, um, we, we got one of the most dominant chess players of all time. We got Emmanuel Lasker. Now, Lasker was, uh, was a German chess master, and he was world champion for 27 years. He was the world champion, the longest reigning world champion to date, by the way, 27 years. Now, you know, back then there might have been 12 chess players. It's, I'm joking. I'm not trying to discredit the accomplishments of, uh, you know, of, of, of giants. But it is interesting. He was the world champion for 27 years. And he was defeated ultimately by Jose Raul Capablanca from Cuba. Cuba, uh, excuse me, Capablanca was, despite being world champion, for only six years. And losing it to Aljochen, who was a genius of dynamic play around that time. Capablanca was deemed... The epitome of simple, clear-cut positional mastery. He avoided tactical situations different to the Romantics and would seize a seemingly small advantage that he would convert into the endgame. His endgame skill was considered the greatest the world had ever seen. Frequently when we talk about chess history, we say Paul Morphy would have been 2,700 nowadays. We say all these players would have been 2,700. Capablanca is widely said to probably transfer his skill set the most to modern-day chess. And a great example of this, again... I'm not going to try to show you these games in excruciating master class level detail, but Capablanca was a surgeon. He was a technician, all right? And Capablanca would play the Queen's Gambit. You'll notice again this style, Queen's Gambit. The same thing that Nimsovich played, Tarash played. Um, <clears throat> one other thing, by the way, about the Queen's Gambit, just back to that Tarash game for a moment. One of the openings that 
Tarash really liked to play is he liked to do this. And many openings are named after Tarash because Tarash really liked center control. He liked open space for his pieces. He didn't like to be cramped. That was the scientific school of chess. The hypermodern school of chess didn't mind being cramped. Capablanca was the birth of a more universal anti-tactical player. A player that just somehow understood where the pieces are supposed to go to what squares. Capablanca's playing style, you'll notice, smooth like butter, never complicated. Takes space with his pawns. Slides the queen, takes more space with his pawns, targeting black's knight. Look at black restricted. E5, controlling the knight. Black is stuck in the back rank. We're talking about Lasker, 27 years as world champion. Look at Capablanca transferring the knight onto D6. And Capablanca once famously said, he doesn't need to calculate many, many moves ahead, which is a misconception of chess players. Capablanca said, he only sees one move ahead, and it's the best move. And you'll notice that the control at which this game is, is, is played is unbelievable. Just slowly trading off pieces and just maintaining a comfortable advantage according to the computer. Just a comfortable edge. A bishop for a knight. Straight out of the school of chess of the last 10-15 years. Pressure. Targets. Knight to e4. Looking there. Looking there. A weak king. The concept of multiple weaknesses was also born around this time. h4. Taking space potentially away from the black pieces. Control, control, poking, prodding, poking, prodding, looking for a weakness. This is a weakness. That's a weakness. Queen b7 check. The king runs. Queen c8, threatening on the back rank. And this game comes to an end in beautiful style as Capablanca does find a tactic, but it's only one tactic that he needs. Rook takes h7 as checkmate, but it's defended by the knight. Queen takes f8. And this is the way that Capablanca beat the players of the 1920s and 1930s. I mean, Capablanca was 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 a was a genius. He was he was a simple man. He played you know he played simple and yet genius chess at the same time. It's chess that can only be appreciated, and that's chess kind of cooled off for a little bit. Around 1880, 1890, chess cooled off a little bit. We got much more strategic games. We got openings that were uh, you know combative, but but fighting for the center in slightly different uh, way. For instance, let me just open up a, a separate analysis board. We got the hypermodern school, right, which was which was targeting the center from a distance. We got the Grunfeld defense, which would play like this, d5, and later was adapted by, by players like Kasparov and by Fischer. So that school of chess developed theory for the next 100 plus years. The fact that you could play a game where one side owned the whole central real estate, but you would target that center from a distance. The bishop pair, space advantages, pawn play, so many things evolved from the hypermodern school of chess. And then after players like Capablanca, Alyokhin, we got the Soviet era school of chess. The Soviet era school of chess. And I mean, this, this could get a whole video on its own. It's worth reading about. Let us pop over to our, to our history books. After Capablanca, we had Alyokhin, who was a dynamic genius kind of combining, turning more into universal, positional play with sacrifices, with different types of complex openings and pawn structures. And then we got Soviet dominance. From 1927 to 2006, players from the Soviet Union Russia held the world championship title with only two exceptions. Alyokhin, Botvinnik, Smyslov, Tal, Petro Petrosian, Spassky, Karpov, Kasparov, and Kramnik. The most influential chess figure in the world of chess uh, influential chess figure in the world of chess, my fantastic uh, narrating abilities, uh, and definitely in the Soviet sphere, is Mikhail Botvinnik, Botvinnik School of Chess. He was world champion, and uh, the Botvinnik School of Chess inspired some of the greatest players uh, that the world has ever known. Kramnik, Kasparov, Karpov, Petrosian, I mean, etc., etc. And um, after his long reign as world champion, rather, I should start here, but Phoenix was known for iron logic and dynamic ability, being able to change styles almost like a chameleon. This is where the Soviet school of chess influenced history forever. The Soviets in the mid 20th century changed chess from a niche hobby into a profession. Chess players were athletes, sportsmen and women. You had to be in good physical shape. It had to be your full-time profession. There was more money flowing into, flowing into some of these championships. And that sphere, that sphere of dominance, winning European tournaments, interzonals, 
uh, Olympiads, left and right, different players, like different styles as well. You know, there was the dynamic players like Tal the genius, but then there was Petrosian, ironclad defender. All of this contributed to the rise of Bobby Fischer. The Soviet dominance of transforming the game into a respectable profession influenced Fischer. Obviously, there was Cold War. There, there, there was a lot of geopolitical things as well with chess. But Bobby Fischer spawned kind of out of all of that. He was the one who in the United States would stand up and play against the Soviet chess machine. And Fischer tried to elevate the game of chess yet again to another level of professionalism and respect and sponsorship and media. And he was a star. I mean, he really was. Obviously, the, lat the latter part of his career... You know, it is what it is, and, 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 all the, and all those things that happened. But at the time, it was Fisher. And Fisher captivated the entire chess world in 1972 with his match against Boris Spassky. In particular, this game. This match almost never happened. You can watch everything you want about 1972. Um, Fisher was the first modern example of a incredible prepper. His preparation was unbelievable. Opening knowledge at this point skyrocketed with the, you know, the, the, the advent of uh, chess books, newspapers, research that players did on, on each other's openings, analysis and, and, and databases that they were storing of different opening ideas. This game played in 1972. By the way, remember the Capablanca game? Almost exactly the same, yet 50 years apart. Isn't that fascinating? 50 years, this exact position Holds up the test of time. Now, Fisher was known as a dynamic player. He played many aggressive openings. He was a, a ferocious calculator. He would frequently, uh, f uh, he would frequently fight down to the very, very, very last pieces on the board. Look at this. D takes C5, by the way. A, B, Queen, A8. The, the exact moves of this game are not important. I will summarize them like a sports highlight show. He got the knight for the bishop. Bishop is better than knight, according to the, the shoulders of the giants that these players have stood on, right? E4, trying to sacrifice a pawn to create pawn islands. Positional play, in, you know, influenced heavily by late 19th century analysis. D4, creating a light squared weakness complex. He, he played F4, pawn majority. Now, limiting control of the knight movement. Who did we just see do that? Capablanca. Capablanca did the exact same thing. You have a light squared bishop. You want pawns on dark squares to complement that bishop. Bishop c4. Queen rotating, targeting the weakness that he helped create. b3. Look how many pawns Fisher now combines on light and dark squares, ripping open the position. Dominating the knight. Seizing the attack with the pass pawn. A beautiful universal mix of positional and tactical play. Limiting Black's knight's movement. Completely dominating Black's pieces. The pawn on e6, a long-term asset and he gets in, A4 completely shuts down Boris Spassky, and the way he wins this game, he sacrifices his rook and creates a checkmate net around the Black King. This game was so good, Boris Spassky stood up and applauded. I will make a separate video about this game at some point in the future. The Soviet chess machine stood up and applauded Bobby Fischer after this game. Fischer elevated chess to heights Nobody thought was possible in 1972. Nobody. And from 1972 until around 1996, about 25 years, from 1972 until just the end of the century, right around 1995, let's say, chess became Karpov, Kasparov, Anand, Short, etc., Karpov became the world champion in 1975 until he lost it to Gary Kasparov in 1984. Karpov isn't so interested in his own plan, but will keep on foiling yours. Karpov was probably the ultimate blossoming of the Soviet school of chess. He was an unbelievable player. He was a, he was a, uh, he was a, like a, like a, like a snake. He sucked the life out of you is the way he played chess. And yet, his antithesis was Garry Kasparov. They played five matches against each other. From 1984 to 1990, five world championship matches, hundreds of games. They were the two best players in the world, and it wasn't even close. And it was not even close. Sometimes it was like close between third and second. Maybe there was a good day, bad day. No. And this was the 
le this was less about the game of chess developing around that time in, in, in 1990, 1980. It was less about the game of chess and the styles and the era. At this point, players had styles, but they were universal. They were universal styles. They, of course, had preferences. Karpov Kasparov is probably the last time there was a very clear clash of styles where a player was a brutal calculator like Kasparov. Kasparov played to win with white and black. He didn't defend. The way he defended was he tried to attack you. That's the way he tried to attack. Uh, that's the way he tried to defend, rather. Kasparov played aggressive openings. He played the Sicilian, the King's Indian defense, the Grunfeld, hypermodern openings. Born 70 years prior to his title reign. So did Karpov. But Karpov played openings that were a bit more solid, a bit more kind of intuitive. And the way uh, Kasparov described Karpov's play is that Karpov ma managed to maximize the effectiveness of every single one of his pieces. That's the way he would, he would extract maximum value. And so these two had a rivalry for 10 years. Around that time, Vishy Anand from India became the first grandmaster in India. Nowadays, it's up to like 100. Vishwanathan Anand completely changed chess in India forever, which we will see the effects of in a moment. But Karpov Kasparov was the last time I would say there was a, 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 a direct confrontation of style, and you can kind of see it in this game. Whenever one of them baited the other into their style of chess, Kasparov, uh, th that side usually had the advantage. Kasparov and Karpov played hundreds of games against each other. Look at this one. Kasparov played in a way like a waving a flag in front of a bull. He loved a fight. A fisticuffs type of chess game was everything he wanted. And when it exploded, it was crazy. He would rip open positions. He, 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 would, he would jump his... Look at this. He would sacrifice pawns. Jump his pieces into a, opponent's territory. And he would be down multiple pawns. But then he would win one of them back. And he would strike from across the board. Like, look at this position. This looks like a, like a, like a modern art painting. Pieces are standing on edges all over the board. They're, they're hitting on opposite corners like this. This was the type of style that Kasparov brought. And he struck fear into opponents. His, his opening preparation at the time was unbelievable. But the reason why I say that this era of chess, from 1970 to 1996, when, when, when Kasparov kind of had his big rise, the, this era of chess was, was Kasparov's brutal opening preparation mixed with unbelievable tactical and calculation ability. Unparalleled ability as well in the end games. He was a universal player with one really powerful punch, which was his ability to calculate absurd attacking concepts. His, 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 his level at, and that was uh, surreal. But... Now you have this rise of a player that has bulletproof chess openings with white and black, ideas that nobody has ever found before because there are no computers, coupled with this universal genius style. How do you beat a person like that? Well, the only way to beat a person like that, my friends, is like this. Garry Kasparov became the first chess player to lose to a computer. Right, 1996-1997, the deep blue match. This is when the rise of the chess computers started happening. And of course, Kasparov went on uh, to lose his world championship in 2000 to Kramnik. He, uh, he lost to Kramnik uh, when they played in uh, the year 2000. But I'll pause here. I don't have to show you any more chess games. You say, what are you talking about? You just, last, the, that Kasparov-Karpov game was like in the 90s. What do you mean you don't have to show me any more games? Well, Kasparov retired from chess in 2005. Then, chess became a mix of different world champions. We can take a look at that world championship list, by the way, after Kasparov retired. Kramnik was world champion for a bit, then it was Anand. Anand took it from Kramnik. Anand changed chess completely in India. Just absolutely, just, I, I mean, uh, legend is an understatement for who Anand is. And then it was Magnus Carlsen. <laughs> Magnus Carlsen is the epitome of a universal player, but he's very different from Kasparov. Very, very different. He's not an aggressive tactician trying to completely take the soul of his opponents through attacks. He does it with stamina. He does it with endgames, with positional understanding. But more than anything else, the greatest change to chess from, let's say, 2000 and up until, you know, from like 2000 to 2015, and then maybe in the last like five to seven years, chess has experienced a computer and in particular innovation and information boom. Back in the 16th and 17th century, nobody knew how to play. In the 19th century, 
Players were getting better and learning a little bit more, but so much was barren and un un unknown, and information couldn't travel, and there was no AI that could 100% confirm any sort of analysis, so analysis was constantly changing at a snail's pace. That's the way chess evolved for many, many years. But now, in 2024, chess is so heavily based on computers that it poses an existential threat to the game. In classical chess, slow chess, chess that is played over three to four hours, chess openings are nearly solved, meaning black can face no problems from white. You memorize everything and you get a good position. And that's, that's crazy. And the gap between the top players in the world and the, and, the, and the weaker players, like the top 150 or 200, is closing. Their openings are on the same level. So we speed things up. We make them play 15-minute chess against each other so you don't have enough time. We make them play 5-minute chess against each other so you can play silly openings. Openings don't even matter anymore. There's no point going for an opening advantage, like Kasparov did. Kasparov knew deep ideas in the opening, and that's what he would do. So much of that is gone now because of the era of information and computers. Another thing which is fascinating, Think about how many games are played online at any given moment. We never had that before. Everything played in chess used to be a secret. Now, Title Tuesday, Speed Chess Championship, so many of these online events that are getting played, even you just playing games online yourself are contributing to the information age of chess. It's fascinating, but there is good stuff that comes out of it. The good stuff is this, and this is where I will leave you. Look at the list of the youngest chess grandmasters in the world. Abhimanyu Mishra, youngest ever. This happened in the last few years. Gukesh Domaraju is a teenager. Javahir Sandarov got it at 12 years. These are kids becoming grandmaster before the age of 13. This is what the age of information and computers does. Prague became a grandmaster as a teenager. Nodjerbek. Then we have Negi, who I think is in his 30s. Magnus Carlsen, Wei Yi, teenager. Sadwani. Savion is like 22. Marc-Andrea Maurizzi from France is like 16 now. This is, this is a slightly older list. So many of these players are from the modern generation. Some of them are from the older generation, but so many of these are from the modern generation. You look at the list of the top players in the world. I apologize, this website doesn't have a dark theme. Top players in the world. Ali Reza Ferruja just turned 20, I think. You know, we have Keimer, who's like 18, 19. Teenager. This guy's young. 20s. Teenager. This guy's young. So many of these players are breaking in the world's top 10 or 15. The whole thing is changing. Chess is completely changing. And it has changed so much every set of like 50 years. We started with non-existence. We started with literally there being one or two people on maybe the entire planet who recorded some of these games. And they understood chess at a level that, that was just otherworldly. Players like... Philidor, who invented endgame theory. Tarash, who in invented opening ideas. Anderson and Morphy, who played some of the most aggressive chess games ever. Then we had Steinitz, right? We had, we had like I said, Tarash. We had Nimsevich. We had Reddy. We had players that contributed to hypermodern chess. Chess that it's played to this day. To this day, hundreds of years. Openings from 400 years ago survived the test of time. And it's constantly evolving and changing. Now we have the age of e uh, AI. Computers telling us certain opening ideas work and they don't. Nowadays, you don't try to get an opening advantage. You try to play something that will make your opponent uncomfortable because the whole game has changed. Analysis capabilities have changed, speeding up, constant information out there. And it's fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, and uh, I, um, I look forward to making some more historical deep dives. That's all. Get out of here.